Cool. All right. I guess we can get started now. Um, Eli, do you want to kick things off? Yeah, sure. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Arbitrum community, to an AMA with Liquidy. We have Churro guest hosting here. It's Arbitrum contributor. and Kick it away, sir. Thanks. And Sam, that was a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, and to get started, can you give us a brief background of how do you get started in Web3 and what is the story behind Liquidy? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me today uh, for this AMA. Yeah, so just a personal journey of mine. I've, I've been in crypto since pretty much 2017, 2018. Uh, got started with DeFi mainly when DeFi Summer came around, when you had all these food protocols that were launching as well. Um, and that piqued my interest in DeFi on ch and on-chain stuff. Um, from a liquidity standpoint, we've been around for over two years. We are, in terms of TVL on, in, in, on Ethereum, we are number 13 by TVL. We have over $750 million dollars worth of tvl in our protocol and we as a team are pretty much decentralization maxis in every sense of the word we're also in a way ethereum maxis i would say and that in that front um and yeah one of the key benefits of of, of liquidity and the protocol is that it is pretty much the most decentralized protocol out there in terms of, you know, we don't run any of our front ends. We have over 15 front ends. Our protocol is complete, completely immutable as well uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, we don't have an admin key. No, no one can change anything for the protocol itself. So whatever you see on chain on mainnet is, is what it is. And we also have LUSD, the stable coin, that is the most trustless stable coin in crypto in the sense that it is completely over collateralized only by Ether, the asset and nothing else. So no exposure to centralized stable coins and whatnot. So it makes it a, a pretty uh, desirable stable coin for a lot of people to hold. And it's also the reason why we are here today to talk a little bit more about LUSD on Arbitrum and uh, what people can do with LUSD on Arbitrum as well. Yeah, as a fellow ETH Maxi, I love your the concept of like decentralization for a protocol. So I'm a huge supporter of that too <laughs> on my end. Um, yeah, and yeah, and can you give us an overview of what users can do on Liquidity? Like, what are some of the core features people can do on there? Absolutely. Um, so Liquidity, first of all, is a, a decentralized borrowing protocol that allows you to draw 0% uh, interest loans against your Ether. So the only collateral type that we accept on mainnet is Ether. If you deposit, say, 50, 100 Ether, whatever, you can borrow LUSD against that. One of the core benefits of Liquidity, along with it being immutable um, and unstoppable, is the fact that uh, you can borrow at a collateral ratio of only 110% over collateral. So that, that is better than some of the competitors in the space like MakerDAO or Aave in the sense that we, we're a bit more capital efficient. We are also governance-free, as I mentioned, since the protocol is unstoppable and immutable. There is no governance at all. all uh, when we deployed the protocol two years ago, that was the final state of the protocol itself. So that is a that's uh, you know it's managed by code let's say, um, and also one of the beauties of that is that you know you have a protocol that is a very predictable and also censorship resistant. So as you may have uh, all experienced uh, with the USDC debacle of a couple of I think months ago now, uh, you know you obviously saw USDC DPEG. You also saw some of the other stable coins in the space like like Dai and Frax, who have a lot of their collateral being backed by USDC DPEG as well, uh, those were concerns that were raised. And, you know, obviously people, it, it's always in moments like that when people realize that, okay, decentralization does matter. It is important, you know, to have something that is backed by trustless collateral. And that is one of the beauties of, uh, of liquidity, the protocol, and the stablecoin in the sense that 
you know, it's it's completely immutable and that the collateral that is backing LUSD is only Ether. So when that DPEG did happen, LUSD barely DPEGged, uh, maybe DPEGged for like an hour or two, just because of the panic of people, I guess. Uh, but then within that uh, time frame, within, within a few hours, it was back to being at a dollar. So I think it also, uh, that kind of showed the confidence uh, of people, of people, of, of it, it showed two things. First of all, the confidence of of, of, mm-hmm. of people to move into all USD because of you know not being want to not not wanting to hold a stable coin that is backed by centralized collateral. It also showed like the resiliency that LUSD has as, as a stable coin. Yeah, that those events that occurred was actually yeah it was pretty pretty scary for people that had exposure to those stable coins because people weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, so it's great to hear that you guys have some sort of mechanism for uh, the stable coin to be backed by, you know, Ethereum, for example. So that's really interesting. And uh, for, for those in the audience, um, what what is the importance of a stable coin being backed by something? Maybe you could touch a little bit on that front for those that don't understand much about uh, the technical aspects of st- stable coins in general. Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's so when, when you think about stable coins, you got to think about three things, right? The first is scalability. How large can a stable coin grow? Now that's where your centralized stable coins like uh, USDT and USDC uh, are very efficient in the sense that for every a uh, dollar of USDC or USDT on chain, both Circle and Tether have a dollar of um, in their bank account, in their bank reserves uh, uh, in, in, in the real world, right? And in that sense, you know, it can be quite scalable, but where where they miss out on is on the decentralization aspect of it. How resilient and censorship resistant is USDC and USDT? On that front, they're, it's it's not as much, right? Because obviously, uh, with what happened with uh, the, the the Silicon Valley uh, situation, where US Circle had a few of their USDC reserves in a in a bank account that caused panic amongst people, and even preceding that, when Tornado Cash, uh, this Tornado Cash situation happened, where C- Circle was able to freeze uh, uh, a, a con- the contract where where USDC was stored within Tornado Cash, so. You know, on that side of things, it, it's it's not the the most you know resilient. Uh, another thing that people need to think about when choosing a stablecoin is that okay, what is the collateral that is backing that particular stablecoin? Now, a common example of decentralized stablecoins in the space are Dai and Frax. Let's give an example for Dai. For example, Dai has around forty uh, percent, I believe, of their of the collateral that is backing Dai is USDC. Or you know different forms of USDC, be it in a LP or whatever as well. Now the problem that stems from that is you know let's say the U.S. government or whoever says you know okay I need you to freeze that uh, USDC or you know the USDC gets frozen some in some color, in some aspect dies forty percent of dies value is essentially uh, frozen in that sense so it's not really one-to-one back in that sense, right? So those situations could occur. And with the the, Sil- the Silicon Valley situation, that was a fear that people had with with the, with uh, USDC being uh, in, in the Silicon Valley account. People were scared that, you know, that could cause a cascading effect of with Frax and, and DAI as well. And, you know, also us in crypto, we have been a bit uh, traumatized by events with, UST and Luna and stuff as well. So it, it obviously added to the panic as well. So that's where LUSD is, you know, really shines. LUSD, another another stable coin that I would like to mention is Rai as well, where we really shine is the, is the fact that, you know, we don't have a centralized entity or we don't have centralized collateral that is backing LUSD. The only thing that is backing LUSD is Ether. And currently in the liquidity protocol, there is over a collateral collateral ratio of over 270%, meaning that for every LUSD that is out there, there is $2.70 of Ether that is backing it, right? And Ether cannot be frozen, cannot be seized. Um, and that's like the trustless 
uh, capability that we provide with LUSD that that users should look out for. You know, it's not that it's it's only a, if you see a stable that says it's decentralized, that means that it's decentralized. You need to actually look to see what is the collateral that is backing that particular centralized decentralized stablecoin in order to understand things better. So I think because of the because of the you know situ- the the concern that USDC caused for for the guys over at Maker, I think now they're looking into real world assets and also some other uh, uh, collateral types in order to kind of diversify away from from uh, having you know centralized uh, stable coins as collateral. But hopefully, this will also spur more and more protocols and more and more people to to remember that you know decentralization does matter. Yeah, of course. And on the user end, um, are these loans? So when someone takes out a loan on Liquidity, right, um, mm-hmm. they could use Ether as collateral too, right? Yeah. So so a new use case would be you deposit your Ether, you take a loan for LUSD out. What you can do with that LUSD is a few different things. Uh, you can obviously use it on mainnet, on the likes of Curve and a few other yield sources that I can share a Dune dashboard that we have that shows all our yield sources where people can deposit their LUSD. But you could also bring that over to Arbitrum and use that on Arbitrum. Now, what are the benefits of using that LUSD on Arbitrum, you might ask? It is the fact that, you know, obviously Arbitrum has, uh, it's a lot more accessible for people. The gas fees on Arbitrum are a lot lower. So, you know, even smaller holders can use that LUSD uh, on, on Arbitrum across different yield sources. Uh, the other benefit is as well is that, you know, Arbitrum has a very thriving and growing um, uh, DEX ecosystem. So, you know, that's another benefit that, that uh, LUSD holders who want to move on Arbitrum can, can benefit from. You have all of these different protocols that are, you know, bringing about uh, new use cases that bring, you know, the best of Curve and the best of Solidly and a lot of these uh, near innovations that we see. So those are some use cases that, you know, an LUSD holder could, could use on chain on DeFi itself. Another use case that, you know, you can see as well is that, you know, since L- LUSD is very censorship resistant and it's trustless and the protocol is immutable. What we have seen is that people are using depositing ETH on liquidity, taking that LUSD, and then using that LUSD to buy houses or cars or even pay for their like daily expenses in real life. Um, the benefit being that since Z- liquidity has only a one-time fee when you borrow and we don't have an annual recurring interest, so in in that case, if you plan ahead and you have like a very safe collateral ratio or whatnot, you can actually benefit quite a, quite a lot from you know borrowing LUSD and then off ramping it into your local currency and using that for your daily expense as well. We actually have a case study coming out of a of a user in Guatemala who just did that. Uh, that'll go out shortly. But yeah, there are a few different use cases that you can use for LUSD, both on chain and off chain. Yeah, I'm honestly really curious to read more about that um, case study because um, what you just said about how a person in Guatemala is using um, liquidity stablecoin for their own personal expenses, um, honestly, that's really interesting and fascinating to see because it just shows you how DeFi is starting to move in a direction where there are real life, in real life use cases for it, like liquidity for example yeah and you know his his example and we'll have that case study out in like pretty much the next hour but his use case was he was he went to a bank in guatemala to try and get a loan and they said 24 percent apr to get a loan to, in guatemala you know and like that's that's liquidity is one thing but also DeFi. you know how much more capital efficient is DeFi in that sense if you compare that to getting a 24 percent loan in Guatemala, you know, so for developing countries, like, I think it's it's not the same as, you know, the Western world and the US where like, uh, like we benefit from a lot of the privileges that we have, but in the developing world, it's a different, different uh, world altogether, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's great to see that, you know, DeFi brings actual change and utility to, to people in, in those countries as well. 
Yeah, that's that's a really high percentage. Can't imagine like having to, you know, be have, having that awareness of you know that twenty four percent. That's super high. Absolutely. Yeah, and in terms of, so you guys have the stable coin, L USD, right? And you guys also have the liquidity token. Um, so I'm wondering, in terms of use cases, what are some of the use cases for that token? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So LQTY is essentially the secondary token issued by the liquidity protocol. What it captures is the fee revenue that is generated by the system. So essentially, if you were to stake LQTY on mainnet itself, you would every time someone were to borrow from liquid, the liquidity protocol, you get that revenue and you also get uh, what are called redemptions. Every time someone were to redeem their LUST for ETH, you would get ETH uh, as, a, um, uh, as a reward for staking as well. However, we also have liquidity LQTY, the token, now on Arbitrum. And on Arbitrum, there are actually multiple places where you can earn yield for providing liquidity. So you could some some names that I want to kind of drop so that people can can know more about it is there is an LQTY uh, ETH pool on Camelot. There is also an LQTY ETH pool on Ramses. And you know the APRs here obviously are vary, but they're on the double digit side. So if you would like to you know deposit LQTY on on some of these protocols and uh, earn uh, yield on either their native token or on wh whatever they, they have as a reward, you could definitely do that as well. But for now, there are multiple use cases. One is just taking on layer one itself, where you earn yield on, uh, we call it real yield because it's essentially yield uh, on borrowing issuance, which is paid out in LUSD and redemptions, which is paid out in ETH. Um, but if you'd like to earn more and, you know, take a little bit uh, to go go on to like Arbitrum to or to kind of uh, save up on gas fees and whatnot as well. Then you can definitely do that with the likes of Camelot, with the likes of Ramses, um, and and with the likes of uh, uh, Solid Lizard as well. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And in turn, I know you you just mentioned real yield for a second. Um, I have a question about that. Well, what do you mean by real yield? I know because. I've I've seen that word being thrown around a lot in the DeFi ecosystem, um, where products are saying, "Oh, we offer real yield." But what what is what is the definition of that? What does that mean for users that are trying to get some real yield? So real yield for me is a yield that is not paid out in inflationary tokens, and in the form of either a stablecoin or ETH. Um, so that is what I mean. In in my world, it's essentially anything that is does not have inflationary rewards, or, or and also has either a stable coin or ether or even BTC. Let's say, if that's the kind of the yield source or the yield that you're getting back, and it also, in my opinion, it also comes down to you know where that yield is coming from, right? So with LQTY staking on mainnet. The yield is purely from the borrowing volume. So the more vo bo borrowing that the liquidity protocol has, that is what the stakers receive as, 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 as LU, LUSD because of the one-time borrow fee that we have. And we also get it from redemptions, which is essentially whenever people redeem their ETH for LUSD, that ETH goes towards uh, LQTY stakers. So the yield that you get is pretty much, you know, actual uh revenue driving use cases that you see from the protocol itself. Um, so in my world, the real yield essentially means, you know, okay, what is driving revenue for the protocol and also, you know, yield in non-inflationary tokens. Yeah, that that's interesting because yeah, like you said, it's really important to have that, um, the economic system in place where users are aware that, where are these like revenues coming from? Where where they're receiving the yield from? So that's like really important to have, um, especially like in the DeFi ecosystem because um, I know like in DeFi summer you had all of these protocols like having like a thousand APY. <laughs> um, I've seen that before, and it th those times were pretty insane too. Um, 
but yeah, no, the, I, I, I have, I'm like really interested into uh, real yield. I feel like it's an interesting concept and it's important to have because you want to ensure that you have the same, like you have a good system in place where people know where the revenue is coming from. Um, so that's, that's cool. And do you guys have anything planned on the roadmap for this year? Yeah, of course. I mean, you know, it's always a, from the main protocol side of things, it's immutable and we can't make any changes to the protocol itself. But that does not mean that, you know, we can try and growing more use cases for LUSD and LQTY. And one of the things that we have focused on for the last five, six months is really trying to grow uh, liquidity and use cases for LUSD and LQTY holders on layer twos. So on Arbitrum, obviously, right now, you know, you can earn yield on LUSD across uh, five to six protocols uh, where you can deposit LUSD and you can earn yield uh, as a liquidity provider. The same goes for LQTY as well. But what we're excited for in the coming coming weeks and months is the fact that now we have a Chainlink Oracle on Arbitrum. And one of the cool things about that is now it provides a whole different use case for LUSD, Right. The one one being that LUSD can now be used in borrowing and lending protocols on Arbitrum. So, you know, the, your, your, your Radiance, your Aves, your uh, whoever else is a borrowing lending protocol on, on, on Arbitrum, they could have LUSD as a collateral asset or, you know, it could be a place where you could borrow LUSD as well. To, to, to use that to farm in, in different uh, yield farms on Arbitrum. And the other use case that we see is because of the Chainlink Oracle, we can now also get LUSD involved at, in more like um, sophisticated use cases in DeFi. So what do I mean by that? So let's say perp markets and options markets where you have perpetual uh, leverage trading uh, uh, pairs being settled in LUSD and options option protocols being settled in LUSD as well. So those are some like use cases that with the with the re- recent chain link oracle that we're going to try to explore more and more. Um, and as, as far as LQTY goes, it's the same there as well. We just want to try to find, you know, more use cases and utility for for both uh, for both tokens on, on other on layer twos. Yeah. yeah, no, all that sounds really exciting. And it's crazy to think like how many doors could open with the chain link feeds so, so this is good for like the the super degens that you know love using perpetual option protocols, and obviously there there could definitely be some use cases for um, the LUSD. So the community here, I'm sure they're really extremely excited to see that happening happening here in, in Arbitrum since we have a huge DeFi community here. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, you guys with on Arbitrum, you have GMX being like the pretty much the, the king of the perpetual uh, perpetual leverage trading space. And on the option side of things as well, I, I know, you know, you've got obviously Dopex and a few others like I believe Lyra and a few others too, right? So it's definitely, I think Arbitrum has always been the home of DGENs in my opinion. So I'm sure they'll appreciate if, if LUSD were to get integrated with some of these protocols yeah and in terms of like on the community side of things do you guys have anything planned for the community in terms of like events yeah absolutely so we will definitely under in terms of ir irl events we will definitely be uh, going to a few conferences over the next few months we'll be at uh block split in croatia we're going to be at etc we're also going to be at eth belgrade uh, we do plan to host some side events at those events as well. So, you know, definitely follow us on Twitter, follow, come join our Discord as well. Uh, we would love to meet our community and people who believe in decentralization and USD. Uh, uh, we might do a few, uh, you know, fun activities on these events as well. So we we'll definitely, would we'll definitely, uh, love to see you all there in, in real life. Um, uh, on the, on the, um, on the online side of things in the DeFi world, uh, I guess, you know, we were very thankful for the Arbit- Arbitrum Foundation to to have given us uh, some allocation uh, uh, for, for, 
for the chain itself. So we're still thinking about that as to how we use that to to kind of benefit the community the most. So, you know, right now we're still in the thinking phase of, as to how we go about it. Yeah, all that sounds really exciting. And I'm definitely foaming for ETH CC. <laughs> I'm definitely going to miss out on that one. But yeah, I'm sure it's going to be a great time over there for you guys. Yeah, we're really looking forward. We're really looking forward to it. I mean, it's one of the biggest events in, in Europe, I feel, for, for Ethereum. So it should be a great blast. Yeah. And I know we are we have a few minutes left, but uh, do you do you have anything else you want to mention for the community? Um, if so, feel free to chime in. Yeah, so I, I guess we, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a Dune dashboard that highlights it's pretty much uh, all the different places that you can earn yield on both LQTY and LUSD. I'm just going to tweet that underneath this chat, this spaces right now for people to see with our official account. Um, that way you can have a look at, you know, what are the different places where, where you can deposit your LUSD or LQTY and earn yield uh, on Arbitrum. And also, you know, for, from, from our side, you do follow us on, on, on our Twitter account and our Discord channel. As I mentioned, we will come, be coming out with a case study in the next hour or two, which details an own experience of someone who took a loan out uh, with their ETH and how they saved up to 20% on APR uh, compared to the real world. So yeah, definitely follow the Liquidity official account. You can follow myself as well for my DeFi musings, but thank you so much uh, for, for joining this AMA. And, Thank you, uh, the Arbitrum team as well, for having us. Yeah, likewise. And we wish you guys the best. And thank you again for coming on to speak about Liquidity and all the great things you guys are working on. And I'm sure the Arbitrum community is really excited to to have you here to build in our ecosystem. So thank you so much again. Thanks a lot. Have a good right. day. Yep. Happy Wednesday, everybody. See you guys later. <laughs>